Hello folks, this is just after a fresh restart and there's nothing running. Now I always have a number of virtual desktops, usually seven of them like I do now. And on the first one I open a full screen terminal, shell, command line, what have you. And on my second screen I open Jupyter. I usually wait until I open the command line, until I open Jupyter, but I'm going to show you what happens if I do it in the wrong order. There's that. Jupiter can't be reached. Now, Jupiter gets run when I load a Linux terminal. For the first time, there's a Linux system invisibly booting in the background there. And we'll get a command prompt and uh, there you have your message. There's one I set up, right? It's not how the default of Linux, but in these, this system, in this command line, you can now optionally see it running here as a server, but we're not gonna do that for a moment. We're gonna go right back over to here and hit refresh. And whereas before Jupiter was not there, here it is now. And it brings me into a project where I was working on some Twitter works, pulling down my Twitter feed to make into a page on my website, which I had actually done. That's a complete project referred to prior video. And on this video, I just wanted to make sure that you understood that when I run Jupyter, if I were to say create a new file here in the practice directory, that this is running on Linux, that this Jupyter, even though it's displaying here in what is much like a web browser, when it does stuff, it's actually talking to uh, Linux in the background. So if I were to do stuff like, I don't know, I think it's from OS import version. That might be the Python version from sys import version and I can say version so this Python 3.11.1 is uh, the Linux version that is actually uh, the Linux version so let's see another thing would be a get current working directory I think it's might be oh from I'll just import sys, import sys, and I'll do what all the IntelliSense addicted do, which is type something and then let this thing pop up. So I already checked version, so now I'm actually interested in, oh, say the executable, that's an interesting one. So see these forward slashes? My Python executable is located in a virtual environment inside my home directory. So when it reaches for the Python executable, the place it's pointing to is inside a virtual directory, which you could also see reflected, I believe, if you go into uh, new, yeah, new uh, terminal. So see these forward slashes here? that shows us that we're in Linux. Now it's not showing us that we're in a virtual directory, but uh, let's see, Python. Run Python from within a Jupyter terminal. Pretty funny, right? So uh, it's system executable, I guess I could find and see if it's coming out of the same home directory. Import sys sys.executable sys.executable and lo and behold it's pulling it out of my same virtual env so that shows us that even when you're using um, linux in the background if you have a virtual env set up when you launch uh, jupyter lab your terminals from within here will be likewise uh, Pythonically contained in their virtual environments. 
Now when you do that, that leaves them around actually still running. And you can shut down a terminal deliberately by going like that. Uh, likewise, if you close out of terminals all the time, you're often likely to have, you know, abandoned, uh, you know, running but not displayed uh, kernels, whole instances of Python executable in memory in your computer. So it could bog down uh, your computer if you've got a lot of them running here and you forget about it. So it's nice to do a refresh every once in a while. I actually rebooted the system because I wanted to show you here this environment that I'm using it every day. It's my main, you know, go-to for doing SEO work, Python things, and it's all Linux. It's Linux through and through. If you wanted to move something over for 24-7 scheduling, you can do that. You can do that right here on your same computer because this environment here where there's a terminal is also where things run, can be scheduled to run. And for example, it's running Jupyter Lab right now. So we can do what it's suggesting here, type screen ls. That's screen hyphen ls or minus if you prefer. And it lists the screens that are running. And you can screen hyphen lowercase r for reattach to j tab and it'll autocomplete it and there is jupyter lab running right there in its linux mode under a gnu screen terminal uh, you can see this is some of the decoration that i layer in to let me know what uh, i'm looking at that i'm looking at a gnu screen terminal so control a control d will reattach it and you're now out of the terminal this is just a little bit of uh, screen terminal redraw trash so you can always clear and there it is fresh again and um, yeah if you were to pip install here whatever you pip installed is also available over here in uh, Jupyter so it's just all one big happy Python execution environment uh, what is true on the Jupyter notebook side is generally true on the Python side where you can also be running things in more like a server mode here. And I'll get into how you uh, run those services like you saw me running there with Jupyter. This particular service is running under almost a, a shell. It has a, a nested shell. So from a shell, I'm opening a program that runs in a shell, but that shell is running in a very special place uh, which is in memory on a terminal server. So it has no display. It just knows that it can provide a connection to give the data that could build a display. And in one of those sessions, it can be disconnected from, it can be detached, right? They're allowed to have no display. That's the special thing about the GNU screen program. Again, I'm talking about screen. You can do screen space minus minus help and then you can read about it if you wanted to get a little bit of a clue as to all the wonderful things this terminal program can do but I don't use it for all these wonderful things and it's like git in that way there's a tiny handful of tricks I use it for and uh, this is one of the key ones it's to have things running in such a way that you can check in on them. You can con connect in and look, you see. So if we're gonna connect in and look, then uh, we can either do it with an uppercase R, which if the screen didn't exist, that would create such a screen. So that is a way of creating them with uppercase R. But since we know it is already there, we use lowercase r because we wouldn't want it to create a new instance. That would probably mean I misspelled this part, which I can't misspell using command line completion as I'm doing. And that pops you in there. And then here's the part that you just really need to be told. It's a uh, control A. And while you're still holding the control key down, you tap D. So it's control A, control D, control AD if you prefer. 
and the control A is the prefix to a lot of other commands from GNU screen. So these nested control one thing and then another is one of the command line weirdnesses that you might have to get used to, just like screen redraw not being completely as polished as would be a normal, say, Microsoft product. This is not technically a Microsoft product. This is Ubuntu Linux we're looking at. LSB underscore release space minus minus all. You are looking at Ubuntu 20.04.5 long-term service release focal fossa. They don't say the animal. That's disappointing. They should say the animal. So, um, yeah. Learn Linux, man. You got no excuse. Here it is. Here it is right as part of Windows. I'm doing it on Windows 10 because as of October of 2022, Microsoft backported Windows subsystem for Linux, the one that has graphic support and the one that has you know, that has system D support. System D is the key thing. So when you see me go screen hyphen ls and you see that screen there, I could control C out of it and it would pop right back. It would relaunch itself. That's because it's a service. It's not just run through GNU screen. It's run from system D. Shall I show you that? Should I take this video all the way? Yes. Okay. In order to show you how our SEO tasks are going to be run as if on a server, but on your Windows desktop, you are going to go to CD slash etc slash system d slash system and in there you will see a number of running things well maybe some are running maybe some are not you check with usually sudo but sometimes sudo i think you can get status by doing uh System CTL, because System CTL controls System D. This is a System D thing, so we use System CTL uh, to check the status of Jupyter service. So when we check the status of Jupyter service using System CTL, we get a lot of good information about being it being active and running. Isn't that nice? It's active and running, and you see a bunch of different things about it. But the main thing, now that you understand that it's running, is to show you what it looks like. LS. Uh, I'll just vim it. I can't make any changes to it when I vim it, but if I wanted to edit it, I would have to do a sudo. sudo, 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 sudo vim. Now this lets me edit. I'll, I'll finish this way, but I won't save any changes. Jupyter service. I made this Jupyter service file here. I was like, I would like Jupyter Lab to be running but I would like it to be running as a service under system D um, in such a way that I can still connect in and look at its console. You want to connect in and look at its console? Why, yes, yes I do. Well, this system isn't that friendly towards it with all the parameters and the long command that would have to be and the defense against double running. I'll tell you what, why don't you just try and run this script in SBIN, user local SBIN, called start Jupyter, right? That way you don't need all those parameters. You just put this one little short line. User local SBIN start Jupyter. Okay, don't mind if I do. So we'll point out some other things. This forking is, it's forking important, I'm telling you. Um, as is uh, these environment variables I had to provide for uh, I think for, for, oh, 
to use a configuration path that's actually mapped to the Windows side so you don't lose your Jupyter configuration between reinstall of uh, Linux. So you could update your Linux all the time and all your config files can stay Windows side saying, hey, I'll see you again soon as long as your um, sometimes uh, symbolic link, the ln command, ln space minus s to create a symbolic link. So uh, the location, that's what gives the decoration to the GNU screen. So you can tell a GNU screen from a non-GNU screen. But I wanted to show you start user, user local SBIN start Jupyter cd slash user slash local slash sbin ls oh there's not a lot in there this is how i start my journals and this is how i automatically start jupiter as a service every time wsl starts sudo vim start jupiter what's going on in there oh well the start jupiter command create some environment variables so that they'll be available so you'll have Linux with graphics your Linux has graphics when called from Jupiter wait what do you mean I mean that you can open a Linux web browser from here remember that practice directory I was telling you about go into say practice let's see Chrome. There it is, browser automation. Want to see some browser automation? Here's some browser automation. We only need this one. Do, do, do. There's Google pulled up under Chromium on Linux. Want to see that again, but instead of Chromium, uh, we'll use. Uh, Oh, this is Chromium again still. What's the difference? I'm doing something different. Oh, this is default without defining anything. See, I don't even think I see Chromium mentioned there. That's what comes up default. Or with Chromium in particular in uh, session mode. Oh, yeah. Here's what I was trying to point out launch persistent context so yeah session mode lets it keep that same browser you know uh, browsing session cookies aren't reset so it can do stuff and it remembers you know cookies that have been set locally on that session and uh works as a browser and now we'll show it again uh, on this one but this is with firefox firefox automated from Linux from Jupyter running in Windows which is really running Linux so you can do playwright automation here is similar but this time with genuine uh, genuine uh, Chrome this is in fact you might recognize my little alien on my uh, Gmail account Right, there's my little alien. This is as me. And so that was genuine uh, Chrome using my genuine location of my Google Chrome uh, profile, which is what would be used if I ran Google Chrome. User bin Google Chrome, you mean that's something that you can just run from the Linux side? Yeah, we don't need no stinking icons to double click to run a program. We just open a terminal, and in that terminal, we type the name of the Linux software that might be graphical, and it'll dump some vomit to your screen, but it'll run the graphical software. See, this is genuine Google Chrome with the uh, alien icon and all. And look, I can visit my site under Linux. This is what my site looks like. That's not good news. Oh, this is embarrassing. Let's look at it. Hey. 
Oh, there they are. Let's look at Pipulate instead. That's a little better. But isn't that interesting? I've taken advantage of a lot of nice features in the browsers for uh, the pretty look I desire. And it doesn't render all that well on the Linux version of the browsers under WSL. I have taken note of that. This is what it's supposed to look like. How to resist obsolescence. All my best tricks are belong to you. Poetry. AIs in Wonderland. The worried walrus worries much about the AI blather. A bigger bully's on the block who spews the bullshit matter. Elder oysters do defer a pleasant conversation. Linux, Python, Vim, and Git makes carpentry your station. In the most positive way possible, I know there are those who think that the people in charge just take advantage of weak carpenters. But I'm a little more optimistic than that. Platforms, they all just f -f fade away. Don't just run proprietary. Some skills survive extinction events. Next two to five years. Looking for the lovable stuff and drawing a line in the sand. WSL will install your life. I really was never that impressed by the whole Unix and C programming thing. And it took me a while. You know, I found my Python people, right? Things finally just clicked. Oh, they really clicked. Python on Linux was this wonderful Venn diagram of beautifulness, right? But it's not mainstream. Along comes WSL. Now it's mainstream. All right. So the trick is for stuff to go with you. It's not easy for stuff you learn as a young person, the hot skills that make you look so good and able to work magic are yesterday's, you know, oh, everyone knows that, that's so played out. And so we always got to be on top of things if we want to stay relevant. And of course now machine learning, machine learning, machine learning. But Already we can see most of the code it offers up is, uh, is Python. I know JavaScript is in there and I'll do that as well. JavaScript's tied to a platform du jour. Everything about Node and the particular versions it's up to and the particular state of the uh, client uh, libraries that make all the front end user in interface work. Uh, Proprietary and pretty, pretty, it's pretty proprietary. I'll tell you that. It's not going to survive, you know, whatever next platform Mageddon is coming up. But your Linux skills will survive. Your Python skills will survive. There's a discussion there, and I know them's fighting words for a lot of people, but they're not as much fighting words as Vim skills will survive. Oh, that really tweaks a lot of people the wrong way. And of course, Git, because you got to throw it in there because it's big enough of a category to stand on of its own is particularly necessary. And here I am publicly practicing my craft. And I'm trying to innovate something called the machine learning general license. I guess I really must admit I had uh, ChatGPT write it for me. So that you'll find at the bottom of every one of my pages I have published. So if anything learns from my stuff and is delivering a product based on the learnings from my stuff, it has certain you know requirements and I would like to pull, bring particular attention to the haiku requirement. If as a unique term, when using the data provided by my site, the end user should write an original haiku based on the data and make it available to me, right? 
So the end user, that's probably the machine of the machine learning. That's an interesting question. I gotta work that out. That's why it's such an early version. But I definitely have all my content hanging out there like a honeypot, for one. And two, covered by a license that accommodates for if machines learn off of it. So my homepage is pretty long and you can read it, blah, blah, blah. And I should have probably set a maximum width here so that you can, so it lets this stuff come up and you can see that it scrolls. But boy, look at how nice it, uh, it scales, right? So these width sizes as a, um, I guess percentage of the overall screen size, something like that I'm doing, is really good. Why would you use uh, media queries, media queries, and have different behaviors and have to <coughs> think out thresholds over which behavior changes? Just use the same on all of them. The price of using the same on all of them is, of course, don't even know it scrolls when it's this, you know, configuration. Anyhow. Future proof your tech skills against AI with Linux, Python, Vim, and Git as I share with you the most timeless and accessible tools in technology. And on staying valuable while the machines rise. Everyone should keep a journal in Vim. So, in particular, I keep a journal in my hide journals location so I'm there now and I'm gonna vim journal.md you know what I changed my mind I'm gonna cd dot dot and over to my public website where I also keep journal md and in this journal I will show you how one keeps a journal. This is me scrolling down it. This is all public. It's already published. It's already out there. And it's whatever I am thinking about, whatever I feel like writing about. And I've been doing that for a very long time in my life. And I've been trying to make it so that I can publish consistency consistently and in one place and maybe purge it occasionally. So there was a big purging recently. My older blog posts that I had managed to keep since, I don't know, 2007. A lot started happening in seven. So all my WordPress blog posts since 2007, they're here in this directory. I could show you by going over here, opening up another terminal, and I'll CD over into that same spot. And we LS here, and you'll see that I've got a lot of stuff moved over into uh, drafts. That way it can be part of the Git repository. And, you know, there's all the old directories and there's numbered for years and inside of these years are the blog posts of the months and everything on down. So my old website is still in existence in the Git repository. It's part of what makes it take so long whenever I do any little, you know, Git commit and push, right? So the point now, what point am I making? I don't know anymore. This is a way of working, and it works really, really, really well. I put the journal here. As you see, I actually loaded the journal up here. Now I'll move screens around. This one really belongs here, and the one that's already on there that doesn't have it on there, I can put that anywhere. Oh, here's an available screen, but desktop 3, the web browser belongs on. And these each have a dedicated purpose now. Your journal, right? So I'm going to do ampersand J for new journal entry and see how it sets me up for like making a new video I can be like hello world and I can just start talking about something like probably programming but you know don't stereotype me anyway I've got my little rabbit and I'd like to get Alice here there's some really interesting things going on with um, with my free and open source work right now I'm really adopting the Alice chase the rabbit thing. I'm trying to be consistent, but in different ways in different places. So here's just the rabbit. Now, if you want to see something interesting, you can go to 
https colon slash slash my name is my website m i k e l e v you just got to know to drop the dot there i n you can think of it like oh an i is coming up and that gets dotted let me dot here as well and uh from there you go to ux if you want to see alice and you want to see the drink me page i've been thinking of making this drink me but and you know Mike Levinix, Mike Levinix, that's been with me for a while, and I like that URL as a thing people will discover. So if you go into your browser and you go to that location and scroll down quickly enough, oh, I gotta fix this being offset there. There you will see Alice. You will see the misaligned Alice. Maybe it fits the motif, but it's certainly done better here, which is the actual script that I tell you to uh, copy and paste. This looks pretty good on mobile. That's why I have it so narrow here. But this is the, uh, the Drink Me Magic Potion script formula here. And I won't do it in this video because it would make it enormously long. But now, whereas I had that long squiggly tail of the uh, mouse's tail, <laughs> the tail of the mouse. Now I have Alice falling. I did that art. I went on to a Windows 11 machine where your Microsoft terminal, where, where your command line could be transparent. And I made uh, Alice falling into the background. And then I traced it with ASCII. And so I have original Alice's Adventures in Wonderland ASCII art. I, can't wait to see how long or if ever that gets lifted and added to the collections of ASCII art around the internet because I think that captures that moment we all so know we all know so well in our psyche so nice I'm trying to use vim commands on the web page hardly even a web page this is just a piece of user content being served up in its raw format off of github raw.github usercontent.com slash my username slash drink me slash main slash install dot bat and that's what you get forwarded to when you go to mikelev.in slash ux it gives you a few seconds here and then it forwards you along to that script which uh oh i'll show you how it gets used it'll do the forward again you select all you copy it now sometimes it takes a few extra copies these days in Windows for it to take but then you can go to a desktop here's an available desktop and then you can right click and you can go new and this is how it is on Windows 10 the Windows 11 instructions are a little different and you can go text document and then you have to make sure you uh, replace the .txt extension because this is now install.bat and it's going to warn you, are you sure you want to change what it does? And you answer yes and you see those gears and you know it's correct. And then you edit it. Again, your process will vary per Windows 10 versus 11. This is a Windows 10 procedure. Certain things are just easy in Windows 10. You paste it. You save it, make sure it's saved, you close it, and then maybe you edit it once more to make sure it really saved. Now this sets you up for installing not merely Linux on your system, but Linux with my special blend of Linux flavored Jupyter running on your desktop uh, in a browser. This might look like it's not in the browser. But that's only because at some point in the browser, I went to localhost 8080, or is it 8888? I think it's 8888. Yeah, certainly. And there, too, is Jupiter. It's the same Jupiter as over in that other window, and probably it'll show the same tab open, the same tabs open, the same kernels running. And so this should really make an interesting point. I just pulled this up in the web browser. That's in the web browser there. The kernels, take a look. There's the Twitter, the untitled, the browser automation. And if I go over to here 
and they go into the kernels there's the twitter the untitled the browser automation this is all connecting back into the same exact jupyter lab server whether i am in um, a browser with an address bar or in here with no address bar and um, if I were on edge I would show you how I got that other icon I chose it through a application install thing I don't have edge loaded at the moment but if I did I could show you that well I can bring this up talk about stupid tech tricks right we'll get rid of that one and we'll pull up edge and we'll go to uh, localhost 8888 so we now have three different web browsers pointing all to the same Jupyter server and it's designed to be a one user product yet here we are with three identically opened make me eat my words look at that it just has the launcher let's see what kernels are running the same three kernels are running so it had slightly less ability here to reproduce the open bra tab browsers that I have here, which is an Edge application that's been installed by running Jupyter in Edge and then going here to apps. And it already sees that it's an app. But if it didn't know, recognize it as an app already, it would have the option of install new app and then you install this web page as an app and then you have the app available for in your start menu as a tile if you're still on Windows 10 uh, or as an icon under your start menu on Windows 11 and as an icon on your desktop for that matter that is that is how I get that nifty uh, Jupiter icon sorry I'm probably making it dizzy but look at that nifty Jupiter icon isn't that cool? You just double click that and you get a full screen Jupiter. Dare I do another to create a fourth instance? I will not. In fact, I will close this one. And I will close this one. And I will reiterate the point that three screens, three very traditional apps. On this one now, I generally keep Edge open full screen. So, well, not quite full screen. This is not quite full screen. And in, because I like working in not quite full screen mode, right? See, you still got your task bar. I like to strip the task bar down to the bare, bare minimum. See that? There's almost no icons here. And there's only what's running here as minimized icons as well. And I find that to be the best way to flip through your screen. One, two, and three. And in fact, you can change the organization here to reflect that. There's your command line, screen one. Now there's all, multiple command lines really open now, so it's not as clean as I'd like, but there's your command line, there's your Jupyter, and there's your browser. Now if I close those other two command lines, but that wouldn't be realistic. I don't really switch to them by doing it here in the icons. I just like to keep the number of things running to a minimum, and I like to use the keyboard shortcut to go left and right between my screens like that. In fact, I used to like to do this a lot, but the screen recording software doesn't capture it. So I have taken to doing the four finger trackpad swoosh, very similar to the Mac gesture. So I just try and tell, tell myself, just do the same thing as you would do on a Mac. And it keeps you somewhat platform independent, independent between two proprietary hardware vendors but you do what you can and you keep a journal and you keep a journal and you learn to use vim without it being a coding environment dear world you are my journal strange days uh, upon us we will survive. We will thrive. Think about the change that's going on and understand what has economic 
value to people especially where it's the type of work you love doing. Go for Ikigai. Ikagai. Ikigai. I'm not sure exactly. Forgive me. But you're going for that. I'm pretty sure I spelled that right. And if you're not familiar with that concept yet, copy by just highlighting. That's an important point here. I'm trying to capture a lot of the interesting things about this platform that might not be evident at first. But just highlighting in, Jup in uh, terminals copies it for pasting other place in the operating system, taking care of that one biggest problem of these you know, different operating system environments, which is getting your copy paste buffer to get along between the two environments. So if you're not familiar with the concept expressed here by the overlapping of what you love, oh, that's so hard to see. That's not the one I want to have displaying. What you love, what the world needs, uh, what you can be paid for, and what you are good at. The intersection of any two results in something which is a good, well, it's a good profession, it's a good passion, it's a good mission, or it's a good uh, vocation. However, when all of them overlap, whoa, the angels sing, the clouds part, and you found your wonderful calling in life or whatever. And so I'm trying for that. I think that is a noble goal. I think it's a good feeling we should all have. And helping others do the same is also uh, something I have, uh, I guess, thought about a lot in bringing this message, this message to the world. What is your message, Mike? My message is... Sure, the world has changed, but not because AI. Yes, it is big, but the most meaningful way, things are different today than a few months ago. is that Linux is part of Windows 10 and 11 now in a meaningful enough way. I hate to make it such a mouthful, but you know, in a you know, in a in a in an impactful way. As few words as possible an impactful way. You can get Linux services. Parentheses system D on a Windows laptop. It's bigger than anyone knows. That opens the door to uh, mainstream development. Uh, to the masses. With the Linux Edge. And without um, Microsoft backslashes is them fighting words maybe them's fighting words a little bit but you know what Ugh. they bought github
for 7.5 billion dollars they control your every dev habit period they control your every dev habit you use VS code I use VS code I keep VS code tucked away where I will never develop dependencies on it. I'm ready to do web dev again. Web dev didn't break my heart quite so bad as the Amiga computer. However, it did. That's where the sentence is. It didn't break my heart quite so bad as the Amiga computer. So web dev broke my heart, right? I am not thrilled about churn. The hamster wheel, no thank you. Traditional? What is now traditional web dev? Because it ain't traditional to me. ASP is traditional to me. And I used lang pr pr templating languages before that. Um, Internet database connectors, IDCs, and H as something X, I don't know. But it came before Active Server Page, right? Connecting SQL Server to the web with some really basic apps. I made a whole intranet based on that. So I live with kooky limits and I learn the strange nuances of tech. Right? So, there are always kooky limits and there are always strange nuances. And people want to play them down. Beware those who play down complexity and nuance. They are both critical. You know, if not you, then your engineers and good uh, methodology to manage complexity and uh, you know take advantage of nuance and benefit you know and benefit or expose the nuance both benefit from and make clear the nuance. So you'll see that a lot in Python. There, There is so much nuance in Python, you won't even believe it. And it's important, good stuff. Uh, I think one of the first things is tuple unpacking. And I did something today that really uh, made me think that maybe this is something I, I should share uh, with the masses because it's so friggin fundamental. So this is where an untitled in practice is another word for delete me soon or recycle me for whatever purpose. Nothing in there is ever really that important. Once you name it to something snappy and get, you know, add and commit it, then it's important. But these untitled here, we'll just uh, say uh, open uh, file name a file name that's probably not there yet foo dot txt as file handle and to use it with a context manager you throw the width open the width in front of the open and now you don't really have to do anything you can just pass and that's runnable oh what did it, yeah no foo dot text right okay so we're gonna fix that we go over here and we say, let's see, that's going to be new. Maybe I can right click here. New. 
new file. There it is, new file. And we'll name it foo. So now we do have a foo.txt. Thank you very much. And when we run that, it just runs. It doesn't do anything but open the file. Now, there's nothing in the file, so even if we tried to do something in there, there's not much we could do except maybe um, try and write into it. Then there'd be something. But for our purposes, we'll write into it with, like, this is line one. This is line foo. And this is line bar. So we've got line one foo and bar. So we'll save that. And we'll, eh, I guess we'll keep it open. It doesn't matter. So with open foo.txt, one, two, three equals file handle read and probably split on the line return. Bam! Let's see what's in our value one. Oh, this is line one. Let's see what's in our value two. Oh, this is line foo. And let's see what's in value three. This is line bar. Isn't that nice? Very Pythonic. So you got a file that you set up just such and such a way, and you know that line one has a certain value, line two has another value. You know, YAMLs are great, but if you don't need YAML, you don't need YAML. You don't need the YAML interpreter. You just with open it. Same goes for people who like to use JSON for these types of files or INI files. There's so many choices for config files. But if, as your config file, you need three values, username, password, token, or whatever, I don't know, you can just uh, splat them into uh, location with tuple unpacking. Because, you know, this creates a file handle to the file on drive. And then that file handle has these methods, which if you're a, v, a uh, VS Code person, you will be happy to know that if you hit the tab and wait long enough, you get something that might be the correct selection of, of things here. Now, it doesn't twinkle your code into existence, like IntelliSense or whatever they're calling that these days. But you likewise will not develop a dependency you don't need. You don't need that IntelliSense. It doesn't make you that much more productive that you hardwire yourself to a power tool. I don't even think you should be hardwired to Jupyter as your power tool for too long. It's just such a wonderful REPL environment. Read eval print loop, as is the command line. But, you know, it's outside the mainstream for servers but a step less so because this is a heartbeat away from being a .py file right anything you write here can basically be copy pasted into a .py file that you could edit the exact same way you're keeping a journal right so you keep a journal here you do your journaling every day yada yada and then the day comes where you want to make that foo file but you want to do it without the nonsense of some tool you have to go through that's not ubiquitous, that's not always there, that's not Vim, and someday you'll go, I'll just do it with Vim or VI or whatever variation they happen to have on that machine because it's always there. And you would CD into your directory that you're interested in, and you would just type Vim and the file name that you wanted. This will be foo2. Dot txt and you'd be in vim and you'd hit i to get it into insert mode and you say this is another line one and then you'd say this is another line two and this is the last you say i draw the line at bar okay and then you hit the escape key to get out of insert mode and then you type colon and then a W for a write and a Q for a quit and the file's there. If you were to LS it, you would see your foo2 sitting right there. 
now you could go back here and instead of foo.txt which makes this output you could hit foo2 whoops oh interesting ha expected three too many values to unpack expected three so did I not make the correct number of lines you know I could have an extra line at the bottom watch this no it's exactly three lines that is interesting oh it splits it on the line return so there needs to be a line return one more line no that is not it either let's just try it as a uh, you know unified and then we look at what's in uni it has two lines underneath now so there's always tricks to take care of that you want to take command of that things go subtly wrong you know there's three values in it right so if you really wanted to do it in one line all right you would know that you have something that's working a lot like a list here and when things work like a list you can grab them from the beginning to x number of units in and i think that would be two because zero items zero one and two would map to that let's try three okay there we go so i put kind of a gatekeeper there and so um one two and three there you have it I draw the line at bar and that's that's a lot of Python and uh, that's a lot that I showed you in this video isn't it yeah I guess so so if you want to follow along with these tutorials that I'm just gonna steadily roll out because y'all gotta speak Python my friends Y'all gotta get yourselves at least a little bit tech literate now that there is a tech literate standard. Now that Unix like operating system, i.e. Linux, has come to uh, Windows 10 and 11 in parity, uh, you gotta get yourself on it so that you can vim a journal. For life, dude, you pull up a journal, you say new entry with your keyboard shortcut and you start doing some new entry there and you think every day and you engage your brain and you practice vim and you figure out what things you need to do which you go over and do in jupiter because it's easier to do jupiter and python you know to do python and jupiter than it is to do it in some vim ide-ish environment you'll get to that but then when you do get to that, you'll become comfortable with it. Okay, it's Python and Vim. I use this in my journal. I know this. I know this. It's Unix. So there you have it. Um, you don't need to nuke the place from orbit. You can let the alien infection, which is proprietary software, live right along with you. Command line side by side with Windows desktop stripped down to a bare minimum that Windows 11 cannot yet provide and then on the day you're ready you run that script and you will have my Jupyter lab Linux based Jupyter lab installed on your Linux, on your uh, Windows laptop 10 or 11 works on both there's qualifications but Post in the comments if you got your questions. Thanks for joining me. Hope to see you again soon. And don't forget to subscribe.